Welcome back to the booth here as coverage of the 2020 season grand finals continues. My name's Ryan and I'm joined by the Czech Hall of Famer, Martin User. So good to have your company, Martin. We're going to jump into a historic win and in here. We've got two players lined up just one match away from making it into our top eight here. Patrick Fernandez facing off against Autumn Burchett in historic. Both of them are playing, well, very similar lists here. Omnath Ramp. And it's seven and three, Martin. That magic eighth win is just moments away for one of our heroes here. Right. So whoever wins this match is going to be locked for top eight. The eighth win guarantees you to be in the, in the top eight. But the person who loses is going to get another chance next round uh, to still get that eighth win. And I think depending on how it all breaks out, we might be looking at somebody with seven wins, possibly also sneaking in top eight as well if they have good, good tiebreakers. Yeah, I think that was, uh, I mean, I, I never, ever, ever try to figure out any of the tiebreaker mats or anything. I'm usually surrounded by much smarter people who can do it for me. And so I just let them do it. But uh, that was the discussion heading into this tournament that we'd have a bunch of people on eight wins. And then maybe, maybe uh, there'd be some number of people that would sneak in on seven. But of course, uh, you've got to be in it to win it until the final whistle blows. And so we're going to have these two players go at it here with uh again what is what are two very similar looking decks there aren't huge differences between these two 75s um the sideboards are built a little differently if, uh, yeah they're... with four copies of clarion but apart from that there's not a huge not a huge number there doesn't seem to be too much of a difference autumn is running uh to yasharn and i do want to talk about that card because that card is one of the most impactful cards from zendikar rising uh yeah. that impacted historic and there's a lot of stuff it does. Uh, players can pay life or sacrifice non permanence to cast spells or activate ab ab abilities, which means that, you know, something like Junk Sacrifice pretty much cannot really do anything anymore once this once this card hits play. But I was just playing a match of Historic as we were waiting for the round to start. And my Gruul deck had two Ramona Prunes in play. My opponent dropped Yashar and I didn't think it would be a big deal. But then I realized I literally cannot even get red mana from my lens now. Yeah. So <laughs> I keep finding them into wastes, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I keep finding like new and new things that Yashar stops you from, from doing, which is really impressive. Yashan has certainly had an impact in uh, in historic in terms of shutting down the Rakdos decks, the uh, the Jun sacrifice decks, what have you. But as you say, it just has this weird upside you wouldn't think about. It's good against goblins. It has uh, it's good against obviously Neo Storm as well. But in this matchup, right. it's just a four mana four four that draws two cards. Although that's not a bad. I mean, that's not a bad right. Yeah, that's true. Some of the players are not even playing a planes. I think. Uh, although, yeah, both of these players are actually playing at plays, but th there are decks in the, in the tournament that are running Russia, uh, Yasharn, and they are not even playing the players. They're just playing it to stop the, to stop the you know, John decks from doing their thing. And as you mentioned, it's really good against goblins as well because they can't mm. use uh, cards like Skirk Skir Prospector or sacrifice their, their treasures. Uh, yes, or, or activate uh, First in Tower as well. So it, it does have some utility there. Both players off to a decent start here, hiding behind their Lotus Cobras, and it looks like Patrick Fernandez, the first one to fire off an escape to the wild. So the uh, the cards are going to flow freely here for the Brazilian. I'm sure there will be uh, screaming fans back in Brazil, of course, a very passionate Magic community, and I'm sure their full-throated support is going to Patrick Fernandez here. The uh, the British are a little uh, a little more reserved at the best of times. A polite round of golf claps, I would imagine, is uh, is 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 about as passionate as. The UK gets a lot of the time. I do but, love uh, the Brazilian. Autumn does have, uh, the Autumn does have plenty of fans around the world. That's true. That's true. By the way, this deck is basically standard legal. Like, there's not a lot of cards in this deck that are only available in historic. Obviously, they do make the deck a lot better. It's uh, cards like Explore and Grow Spiral mm -hmm. basically give you more ways of being able to play on that on turn three, and they also give you more ways to guarantee. That you're going to be you're going to be able to hit multiple land drops in a turn to get you know all that extra value out of your omnath and lotus cobra speaking of omnath here it is joining lotus cobra and there's a terramorphic expanse as well functional reprint of evolving wilds although actually i think terramorphic expanse came first right i believe so yes yeah yeah i'm not sure about that i have to look at that but yes here's terramorphic expanse in any case it's going to get the second omnath trigger here that's five matter available and so now we're going to see an escape to the wilds from Burchett, or oh, sorry, six mana. Thank you, Lotus Cobra. Let's get yeah, the wilds. Green, green floating. You can make an extra land drop th thanks to Escape to the Wilds. You have an explorer in your hand, so you're going to be able to make another one. <laughs> like, yeah, Fable Passage this, as yeah. well. The perfect draw. When this deck starts 
uh, starts rolling, like one of these turns, it's 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 crazy how much stuff you can do in in one turn. And keep in mind that Omnath does not say like when you play your first, second, or third land, it only counts the land for triggers for itself. So if you replace your Omnath, you can start going again. Like whatever land you play after you play your second Omnath is going to count as the first trigger. As, yeah, you're going to be four, etc. Kind of resets the counter there. You can see another landfall card that actually does separate these two decks. We've already talked about the fact that there's not too many differences between these two lists. But uh, Patrick Fernandez is playing two copies of Felvedar Retreat, whereas uh, Autumn has eschewed them, playing... Uh, oh, I'm not exactly... I mean, Barligad Recovery, I guess, is probably the card. I don't know if that's a direct replacement, but that's a card that uh, they're playing rather than uh, Patrick's Felvedar Retreat. Patrick also playing Golos. Uh, so a little bit of extra oomph in uh, Patrick's deck with cards like Felidar Retreat. That can be another way to get uh, to you know get a return on the investment of putting all those extra lands into play. I've been pretty impressed with with Golos every time I watch this deck play. The mm -hmm. fact that uh, your deck is full of all these expensive cards like Ugin and Genesis Ultimatum makes the makes the ability really really powerful. So getting to spin the wheel and uh, being able to cast three cards for free is usually pretty strong. Or rather, even stronger than, than than normal. Obviously, anytime you can essentially ancestral recall yourself and play the cards for free, it's it's obviously going to be a very nice turn for you. Here's Balaged Recovery now from Autumn. Going to get back that Fabled Passage, of course, the uh, perfect card to have on a board like this. These all these landfall creatures lining up. Two copies of Omnath in hand here for Patrick, and I wouldn't be surprised to see one of them deployed. Or we could instead go for that Genesis Ultimatum here. This Fabled Passage with two Lotus Cobra in play is like, you know, two Dark Rituals or something. Yeah, it just gives yeah. you so much free mana. Yeah, it doesn't even cost anything to play it as well. Fabled Passage really just does so, so much work. Yeah, with the two Ultimatums in hand and Escape to the Wilds on the side, Autumn is going to have a pretty crazy next turn. Unless Patrick can do something about it with possibly his own Ultimatum or maybe somehow get the Ugin into play to deal with the Lotus Cobras on the other side of the battlefield, Autumn is, Autumn is going to have a really, really strong turn. So you can see here Patrick taking his time thinking about how this, uh, how this he wants this turn to play out. I never know how to feel about Felidar Retreat in these decks. Like it, it looks like you don't really get the immediate value out of it, but once it's been sitting in play for for a couple of turns, like you start, you're, you're, you're going to get a lot of free two twos. You can start putting counters on them. With all the fabled passages, you get extra creatures and everything. So that is uh, that is always nice. And all right, the so Ugin. Patrick uh, Patrick resets the board here with an Ugin. Uh, that's a one of in both of these lists here. But now Autumn's going to return fire with a Genesis Ultimatum. Let's see what they can find. Ooh, an Ugin of their own in addition to an Omnath. That's a that's a those are some big wow. big hits. Yeah, those are some big hits. You're not even unhappy to see those three lands because of... And look at that. Look at Patrick's response. He did his best. He put an Omnath or an Ugin into play to clear the board, and immediately this ultimatum has just absolutely turned. Oh, things. Bit God, of a roll yeah. of the eyes there from Patrick. He can't quite believe that reversal of fortune here. And, of course, the party don't stop just yet. There's Escape the to the Wild still to come here for Autumn. The triple landfall trigger on that Omnath was also really crucial as it as it helped Autumn kill the kill the Ugin on the other side of the battlefield. So this has been, this has been a pretty big swing. Yeah, that was uh, that was absolutely bananas. And of course, as you can see, two more copies of Genesis Ultimatum in hand for Burchett, who I imagine will be very happy to continue this absolute onslaught here. Lotus Cobra off that explore, right. can still put some lands into play. Still has an activated Ugin as well. Let's not forget that. There's a, a, a ghost fire coming hot and fresh across the uh, battlefield here. Now the seven. Patrick, who trigger. does have... Well, he, Patrick's got an, an ultimatum of his own. So, I mean, maybe. <laughs> let's see if, uh, <laughs> if Portugal favors him just as much here. All right, what are we going to get? See if we can find as, uh, as as Patrick spins the wheel. Let's see what he can find. Okay, it's not too bad. Found an Uro, found an Omnath, couple of lands as well, and another Ultimatum as well in the hand here. So can also pressure that opposing Ugin with another Omnath trigger. There's that third land. Oh, excuse me, the third land will have to come from a... Uh, a cultivate here 
or escape to the wilds. Patrick has six mana to play with right now. Uh, he does have the option to cast Cultivate, but I don't think he would be able to do anything else, really. He can go with escape to the wilds, which is going to allow him to get another land in play as well. There's Uro being escaped from the graveyard. That's not bad either. The only problem with that is it can just be dealt with Ugin really easily. Yeah, yeah, this is the problem here. If you just, uh, you can just Ugin away the Uro. But uh, that will put the Ugin down within, uh, not really within range, but at least it uh, it does something to bring the cut the Spirit Dragon down to size at least a little bit here. It looks like we can still cast a Cultivate or maybe cycle away this Triome. Might be the next thing here. I like just, you know, getting as many lands in play as I can because that's going to allow me to, you know, keep casting all these expensive cards next turn. If you look at Patrick's hand, he has 12... 19 like 24 mana worth of cards in his hand so he is going to need as as many lands in play as he can get yep and with extra copies of genesis ultimatum two more omnaths and a, and a belladar retreat as well oh still had another land <laughs> still another <laughs> land to play still had another land to play so plenty of mana on patrick's side of things back now to autumn who you'd have to think is in a decent spot with this ugin let's see where it's going to go i would say minus three is probably the uh, the likeliest Activation here. Yep, looks like they are going to fire it off. This, this of course, exiles the Euro for good. Yeah, so you don't want to let your you don't want to let your opponent attack Euro. You know, starts getting some extra cards, as you mentioned. Like this exiles it for for forever, so it's not going to come back into play next turn, allowing Patrick to possibly make another land drop. You know, abuse Omnath even more. So, I like this decision by Autumn quite a lot. Uh, Ugin still stays in play, but we know that it is it is pretty likely that Patrick could. Well, trigger that landfall on Omnath three times next turn and get rid of Ugin for good that way. All right, here we go. Genesis Ultimatum once again. Oh, no, nope. first Lotus Cobra and Omnath are triggered by a couple of lands here. Fable Passage. Getting, getting extra mana here, I think, makes sense because if you hit another Omnath in uh, Ultimatum, you want to replace this one. Right, and right. Get all the and extra mana from the new one as well. As you said, start again from the uh, from the from the bottom with a new. Uh, a new Omnath, yeah, sure. All right. So here's the Genesis Ultimatum. And no Omnaths, but still not bad. Yashan also Uro. It's not quite the hit it was last time, but it's still pretty decent. <coughs> See a bunch more triggers put on the stack here. Yeah, Yashar not particularly impressive in this matchup, but it is really, really, really important like in, in the entire format. You saw a lot of players opt for a Sultai ram deck basically to just splash for, for Yashar because it, it, it is that strong in the meta game right now. And I think we're going to see a second ultimatum here. Yes, there it is. And this uh, one, okay, uh, there's that second Omnath. There's that second Omnath, and this is what you oh. were talking about before, Martin. We, if uh, if Burchett keeps the second Omnath now, those triggers they start again from the from the from the beginning. What is happening? How much meta? Oh my God! The double Lotus Cobra with the Fabled Passage as well. That is crazy. Yep. Yep. Autumn it's just needs to uh... make sure that there, there is a there is an extra basic land in their library. I'm not even sure if there is one at this point, actually. So Uro can come back from beyond the grave here. What a turn. This has just been absolutely, this has been absolutely silly. So, so ridiculous the way that these two have just been swinging haymakers at each other. Two Genesis Ultimatum and now plenty of mana left over. Here comes an Uro. Oh, there's a Kenrith. Now this is going to change things enormously here. This Kenrith really, really turns up the heat here, Martin. This is going to be lethal. Yeah, Kenrith can give all yeah. of your creatures haste and, and trample. trample. So yeah, I think we're looking at... A lot of damage coming in. And like keep in mind that Patrick only yep. has one Ugin yep. in his deck and that Ugin is already in the graveyard. So there probably isn't isn't really anything he would have been able to do next turn anyway. So Nope. And so Autumn takes it out there. Battle Cruiser Magic at its finest. And ultimately it is Burchett who manages to uh, very confidently stride across the line after one of the more ridiculous turns. I mean, I just wanna I just wanna give a, a quick, uh, you know, a set of commiserations, uh, rather self-serving commiser commiserations as well, because I'm certainly in this uh, in this group of people here. To all the content creators who substitute skill for doing dumb stuff, like my entire brand as like a streamer and as a, as a content creator with making videos and whatever else is just make like doing silly things that aren't necessarily good. For example, Martin, playing multiple copies of Genesis Ultimatum in a turn but now 
that's not silly. It's the good thing to do. So yeah. shout out, shout out all the other like desperate content creators who are just bad at the game like me and have tried to make stuff that's interesting and dumb and fun and silly who are now playing mono red in standard because it's the weird <laughs> deck you know <laughs> true, true, true. yeah if, if, if you have been wondering like how good is this omnath deck in historic which is a much wider format than standard like this has been a really good example of of how good the deck is like it has those are two absolutely crazy turns by autumn yeah in the in the final stages of, of that game and explore and grow spiral really do make, make the deck uh, a lot better. And you also get access to either Gust, which is a really good card in the mirror, but also against uh, most of the decks in the format. Patrick's still here, considering the finishing touches on the deck, looks to be ready to go. So we move on now to game number two here, round 11 of the 2020 season grand finals. Remind you what's at stake here, of course, a top eight berth. For either one of these players, should they win this match? Of course, at the moment, the wind fully in the sails of Autumn Burchett, who picked up win a win in game number one. So Patrick's got to win two on the bounce if he wants to snag that top eight spot this round. Although, whoever loses this match will indeed get another chance in round number 12. Riley Knight joined by the Czech Hall of Famer, Martin Muser. And uh, ooh, how about a seven-lander? That looks like a really strong opening hand for Patrick, but Autumn uh, has been struggling a little bit with the with the openers. The first one was already shipped back, and this is a hand that we would have to put one of the lands back on the bottom of the deck. And I don't know if six lander is good enough to keep. Like it's it's not horrible because your deck doesn't need to make land drops, but mm. you are really looking for those lotus cobras and explorers and grow spirals to really start the you know, start the game by by putting more lands in, in, into play. So this this is this is a pretty unfortunate uh, draw from Autumn, but they decide to keep. I don't know. I, I kind of like it. I kind of like it, right? Like, you're not going to die in the first couple of turns. And if they've got an Omnath, if they've got the Lotus Cobra into Omnath, like, you're not going to find a five-card hand that's going to beat that very much, uh, you know, a, a, a big percentage of the time. So you just, you just got to believe in the heart of the cards, man. You just got to believe the top of the deck is going to treat you well and uh, and keep a, keep a hand like this. See, opening with a Clifftop Retreat. I think keeping that Ketria Triumph to cycle on turn three. There's Genesis Ultimatum off the top here. Now, the interesting decision is going to be, do you Aether Gust the Lotus Cobra in the draw step? Looks like uh, that's exactly what Autumn's going to do here, getting rid of that snake. But, ooh, will they? Mystical Dispute in response. Okay, Patrick knows that Autumn is not going to be able to draw Omnath next turn because they only have access to two lands, so... Mm -hmm. Patrick decides to use that mystical dispute. Uh, I like I like using the dispute early because the longer the game goes, like with all these explorers and lotus cobras and omnath triggers, it is a lot harder to be able to use the the dispute le yes, later. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, we've already seen how much the card kind of falls off in previous standard, and uh, that's even more so now with with the uh, state of ramp decks everywhere. Omnath comes down on turn four. There's even a fetch land in play ready to go and trigger Omnath again. But we're probably not going to see that this turn. That four mana is, is uh, got nowhere to go. Maybe just cycling away a Triumph, which is exactly what Autumn's going to do on the other side of things. Draws another Triumph. Slowly but surely, uh, uh, slowly but surely inching towards that Genesis Ultimatum here. Very, very slowly. <laughs> go ahead, sorry. Very, very slowly, though. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. And you'd think here that Patrick is in a good position to push the advantage and play now land. It's be, now it's going to be Patrick with one of those uh, busted turns by, yeah, double fabled passage with Lotus Cobra already in play. Omnath is going to give him four, four more mana. That Genesis Ultimatum is going to let him see five new cards. Explore can be cashed in for one more. So this is, this is presumably going to be a very, very strong turn for Patrick. As well as my old cricket coach told me when I was a young boy, what goes around comes around. It's all swings and roundabouts, Riley. And so after Autumn gave Patrick an absolute rumper dumping with uh, Genesis Ultimatum, it's now Patrick's chance to return the favour. We see Triumphs uh, cycled in response. So Autumn enters F6 mode. And now let's see what uh, goodies lie in wait for us here with this Genesis Ultimatum. Yeah. Mm, okay. Oh wow! Another one. Uh, do, we, do we get a rebuy here? I think we can. I think we can go again, oh, right? Yeah. Oh yeah! Oh, oh yeah! Oh yeah! 
<laughs> wow, these are, these are just absolutely ridiculous turns. Like, what is happening? Like, do you re do you remember when we used to play Magic and we used to play Doomlands and like kill each other's creatures? We these used to play one land a turn and we were happy for it. <laughs> yeah, this is like legacy stuff. Yeah, yeah, we would play one land a turn uphill both ways. Can we can we please uh, get the production to put a storm uh, storm counter <laughs> on, on <laughs> land counter? Yeah. <laughs> Oh dear, look at this. Another huge ultimatum here. Bunch more triggers as we see more land uh, coming to play for the Lotus Cobra and the Omnath. Uro also uh, going to hit the bin, but I think probably is going to be able to come back. Are there five cards in the graveyard? Not quite yet. No, no, this no. This is just cycle away one of those explorers. Yeah. And these explorers, of course, are even on mana because they put a land into play. <laughs> um, yeah, and we're, we're definitely not done yet. Here's oh no. no! 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 The party don't stop till cops kick the door in. Look at this. We got we got more lands to play off of this uh, off of this uh, escape to the wilds. Still got two fable passages on the battlefield to crack for those these lotus covers. Patrick Fernandez. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty sure at the like I'm sure he signed up to play Magic the Gathering, but it really does look like he's just open solitaire here. This is yeah. I, I was thinking Patrick is gonna have a really good next year. Now I'm thinking like, is Autumn even going to be able to? <laughs> What is happening? <laughs> oh, dear. All right, across they come for six here, and I think the best that Autumn can hope for next turn is maybe cycling away that triumph. Let's see if they can find anything off the top. They yeah, go over to Autumn Patrick. now. With Patrick in the upkeep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're there's more big expanse. And, oh, that'll be enough, right? Three lands, of course, yes. Yeah, oh, wow. Because there's three fetch lands in place, so we just need to trigger Omnath three times with those three fetch lands. <laughs> In the wow. upkeep, Evolving Wilds into Double Fable <laughs> Passage, and that's all she wrote today, sports fans. In game number two, Patrick Fernandez equalizing in an astonishing fashion. Wow, talk about Battle Cruiser magic. Was that turn, f turn four? It's turn, turn five, Cobra, yeah. Turn two Cobra, turn three, Dispute on the Gust. It was turn five because you could tell because Autumn kept six lands and had four of them in play right right, right yeah right. Right. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> pretty that bonkers was crazy. yeah that was absolutely crazy oh dear all right and we're gonna see a mulligan here once again for autumn hasn't had the best of fortune uh with the openers here but this seems like a, a reasonably solid one got omnath into escape however on the other side of things look at this much uh, much better looking hand here for patrick who's playing double explore into omnath on turn three so you'd think that patrick fernandez already you can see he's scratching his uh, scratching his chin thinking about what pose he's going to pull in his top eight uh, pose photo <laughs> and this is this is a perfect example of why the explorers and gross spirals are so important to add to the oh, deck. Yeah. Like, normally, you only have four Lotus Cobras in standard, and like most of the time, they die to you know Bone Crusher Giant or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So, being able to accelerate yourself with cards like Explore and even draw more cards in the process is 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 really strong. Does Needle another land off the top here? Can he find it? No. Okay, wow. so that's gonna that's gonna take things back a little bit. A little bit of a shake of the head there for Patrick. And doesn't find a land off the Explorer as well. All right, a sniff here for Autumn, who is going to be able to play Omnath this turn, Clifftop Retreat, and ensure that. And here wow. is the Locus of Creation. If you're Patrick, like, you're kind of feeling really good right there, but then the, the last three draw step not delivering the land, wow, that is, that, is, that, is going to, that is going to change the game quite a bit. So cracking this Fable Passage now, and a land off the top. Oh, it's a land. It's a land. But we might see Ether Gust, I imagine, here. No? Okay. Any reason not to Ether Gust the, Ether Gust the Omnath in the draw step there? You can make a really cool play here by Gusting the Omnath in response to the Fable Passage. Trigger. Right. Yeah. Fable this, this, is, this is some real wrinkled brain stuff here. Fabled Passage is going to mean that you will have to uh, search and shuffle your library. Like, you can fail to find, but you still have to sh uh, shuffle your, yeah. your deck. So this Omnath is going to be gone for good, and that is a, that is a really strong play here. Yep, turns uh, Aether Gust into a Doom Blade, basically, or into a uh, Shuffle Away Blade, I don't know. And uh, Escape of the Wilds is the... Play not here the strongest for Escape of the Wilds, though. No, a shake of the head there for Autumn as well. Not happy with the cards that they saw off the top there. Here's a Lotus Cobra. But we're going to see Omnath come down here for Patrick. Let's see what he can find. He'll be looking for another land here. And he found it too. Not bad. Okay, now revealing three or four lands in, in, uh, 
Escape to the Wilds here was not great for Auto, but at least it means that you know they're not drawing these four lands and they're they're getting closer to you know all the all the big cards like like another Escape, like like a Genesis Ultimate, and possibly man, something yeah. like Ugin or or Ulamog. And those so, two, those two gusts are going to do a lot uh, to slow Patrick down too. Yeah, of course, especially when you look at uh, his hand with three copies of Escape to the Wild, Genesis Ultimatum, and an Omnath on board. Here's Kenrith, the king returns. Auden deciding to uh, keep the two mana, obviously, for, for either Gust rather than uh, give Kenrith haste there. And the easiest Aether Gust of their life there, getting rid of this Escape to the Wilds. You imagine that'll go below deck, seeing as Patrick already has plenty more in hand. Now let's see what can be wrought with this Kenrith here. I can tell you exactly what's going through Patrick's uh, Patrick's mind right, right, right now. Please yeah. don't play Ultimatum. Please just have like a couple <laughs> lands, maybe some like interactive yeah. spells. Just please don't play the Ultimatum here. Please don't do this to me. Yeah, you can see a, a slightly worried look here on his uh, on his face. What I'm having with that with signature laser like focus. Burning holes in their monitor with that glare there. Considering Patrick the could, next move. Got that Aether Gust still going. Patrick could really uh, use something like a Fabled Passage next turn. That'd be a pretty busted turn. Like play the two Cobras, then, then drop the Fabled Passage, get the Landfall triggers off of the Cobras, get the two Landfall triggers from Omnath, get a lot of mana, you know, try try start uh, starting to cast all the expensive cards. But uh, with the five lands in play only, it's not looking all that great against the, the Aether Gust right now. Could draw a card with Kenrith, but no, just going to chill here. Get in there with the Return King. Patrick with no good blocks, of course. The 4-4 four four is not going to stand in the way of the 5-5. Five five. And Autumn ships it back to Patrick, who finds a Cultivate for the turn. And now has got some decisions to make. Going to go for the Cultivate, and this is a very ready target for that Aether Gust as well. Let's see what Autumn wants to do about it. Yeah, that would guarantee Patrick to be able to make those two land drops this turn to get more mana from Omnath. And Aethergast targeting the Omnath here. So Autumn doing exactly the same thing that Patrick did to them earlier mm. by saying, okay, you're going to shuffle your deck. Well, let me put this Omnath on the top of it. <laughs> just real, just real, yeah. quick, real quick, before, before you shuffle your library, let me put another little card in there for you. Would be a real shame if something happened to your, to your Omnath. Two islands fit from the Cultivate. And okay. we're going to see, after this, probably another Cobra cast here. Yeah, so this is more of a setup turn after the, the loss of that... Um, after the loss of that Omnath. So and... for Autumn, it is now or never. Like, they need to draw something big. They need to draw the mm -hmm. Ultimatum. They, they need to draw something that, you know, deals with two Lotus Cobras. Oh, or... right off the top! Yeah. There it is. Right off the top! That's exactly what they needed here. Patrick is ready for next turn with his own ultimatum and the perfect mana to cast it. With the two cores yeah. play, it is very likely he's going to be able to, you know, get additional mana. So, mm -hmm. Autumn drawing this Genesis ultimatum here is huge. Absolutely huge. So let's see what they can find with it. Considering if there's any reason not to cast it, but no. Oh, double Omnath, two lands here. So how does this work? There, when two Omnaths come into play with two lands, you don't get all the triggers, right? <laughs> That's, I believe you do get uh, the four triggers. You, you get two cards and you get eight mana, but you're going to have no, to choose really? which one of them. I think so, wow. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, it looks like that's the case. Yeah, of course, because, I mean, you have to sacrifice one of them, but you still get the triggers. Wow. So gain eight life, gain eight mana, and, of course, draw two cards. I mean, that was definitely going to happen. This deck is just crazy. Like, look at what is happening. Out of nowhere, you have, like, a Cobra in play, you know, a couple of lands, Genesis Ultimatum, bam, here's an Omnath. Fabled passage, crack this, crack that, play land, make make more land drops, make more mana. This is this is this is absolutely crazy stuff. It is just, I mean, it is battle cruiser magic. These two players just, it is a race to see who can do the silliest and most ridiculous things. And you can see a smile on Patrick Fernandez's face. He can't quite believe it. He can't quite believe it as we see another land coming to play here. It's going to deal four to Patrick here, and two more mana from these Lotus Cobras. Now, what can this Uro find? I mean, Kenrith also another way to make sure that the cards don't stop flowing here. 
I mean, I think there's there's a chance that Autumn is going to be able to attack for lethal this turn. They have so much mana left over, plus the two Cobras. So you can play Uro. Oh, and then bring uh, Uro then back. Very likely escape it back if there's oh, enough enough cards in the graveyard. And then wow. you're looking at 2, 4, 8, 13, 19 damage coming in with Trample. So the two Lotus Cobras are not going to be able to stop that. Now, you, Martin, you're not much of an EDH player, are you? Uh, not too much, no. Because this is, uh, ah, I mean, this is this is rather but dull in in I, the uh, in that world. It's like, oh, you're only attacking. Oh, you're only <laughs> playing one. This is weird. Okay, this is a pretty pretty calm kind of EDH turn here. So, if you've uh, if you played EDH and, and and you know you're wondering, oh, maybe it's time for me to get into more competitive Magic. Well, now's the time, my friend, because if you're used to just abject nonstop silliness of the EDH table, this is where <laughs> this is where it's your time to shine amongst the best players in the world. Here, we're going to see Uro brought back from the bin. Of course, Kenrith there to give it all, uh, give give the entire team haste. And uh, is, is this, this? I mean, uh, do we even have numbers that go this high? Is this let's go? <laughs> this is just crazy stuff. I was excited about, you know, hitting my Cassandra Mammoth in, in Collective Company. But yeah. Hey, look at this. Like, <laughs> maybe I should rather be casting Genesis Ultimatum instead. Yeah, that's it. You cast a, you, you cast a, uh, you know, a Collective Company like, oh, yeah, Zertar Goblin and, uh, and Gruul <laughs> yeah. Spellbreaker. Nice. Yeah, attack for five. Yeah, really good. And then <laughs> got Autumn <laughs> Merchant. Running these streets with Kenrith the Return King, Omnath, Uro, uh, Lotus Cobra, Genesis Ultimatum, and that is Autumn into the top eight of the 2020 season Grand Finals. Congratulations to them. Very happy with themselves, as you can see. Whew, a big smile and an exhalation of relief for them. Congratulations. Another top eight spot locked up by Autumn Burchett. As for Patrick, of course, he will have another chance now to uh, to snag a top eight spot. The, uh, the his story certainly not over for this tournament as we move into round number twelve. But it's my understanding now we actually got the chance to catch up with Autumn after this win. I understand that Sean Danine Plot was able to uh, to snag Autumn for a quick interview. So let's hear how that went right now. They've been one win away from top eight for what feels like the last. I think it's every round but one. They've been in a feature match, and they've finally done it, getting into the top eight. All of Burchett, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you you were doing Omnath Ramp versus Omnath Ramp as the final match, and that mirror is really tricky to play. Walk me through your thoughts on not just how you play that in general, but against this particular build from Patrick Fernandez. Uh, so pre-board is like mostly gold fishing. I have the single Aether Gust I can draw into, but you're just looking to mulligan towards Lotus Cobra hands or really fast starts. Sure. And then post-board gets a lot trickier because both decks get to boarding cards like Aether Gust or Mystical Dispute. So you're yeah. really looking to try and make sure that if you don't have something very proactive and powerful you can do, you can at least trip your opponent up a turn or two and buy yourself a little bit of time. It was a really fun match to watch, but you're done with Historic. You never have to play it again at this tournament. Tomorrow you'll be running your Gruel Adventures list, which I felt like was one of the real breakout underdog lists that we saw today. I mean, how do you feel about your top eight chances? Uh, I really like the list. Obviously, every player is just incredible in this tournament. The Omnath Adventures matchup is really close, but if there are any Omnath ramp decks that make top eight, very excited to play against those. So we'll see. <laughs> well, you now don't have to play one round. You get one round off. What are you going to do with your free hour? Uh, I am probably going to call the person I'm dating because I need some company nice. at the moment to decompress. <laughs> A very responsible thing to do. And I wish you the finest of luck making that connection in these Times when it's actually pretty straightforward to do that because technology is great. So, hey, thanks, technology, and congrats to you, Autumn Burchett. Man, that was an awesome outro. Let's go back to the caster desk so I don't run the risk of continuing to talk. Wow, what a game. I mean, we really just don't see that kind of silliness at the at the top end of town, at the, at the spiky competitive ed, uh, edge of magic too much, do we, Martin? That was just some, like, legacy level kind of stuff. Like, and, like... It, <laughs> It, it's not even both players, you know, not interacting. Like, they're trying to stop each other with either Gus, with Mystica Disputes, and still, like, you're having these absolutely ridiculously crazy turns where the opponent doesn't even untap next turn. He's like, yeah, I'll start with this Genesis Ultimatum. I'll see what I hit. Oh, wow, you're you're, you're dead. Not bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the way it goes sometimes. It was, uh, it was quite something to watch. Anyway, 
That is that for this match, but plenty more coming your way, my friend. So do stay with us. We're going to take a quick break, but on the other side of it, plenty more historic action for you to, you to enjoy. We'll see you back here at the 2020 Season Grand Finals after this. Hello everyone, welcome back to live coverage of the 2020 Season Grand Finals. Riley and I joined by the Czech Hall of Famer, Martin User, And we are going to jump in to uh, what I'm told is the deciding game between these two players here, Gabriel Nassif and Christoph Pins. Of course, Gabriel Nassif, uh, everyone's second favourite French Hall of Famer, a name that will be familiar to many. And if you've been watching Competitive Magic recently, you'll know that Christoph Pins won the Players' Tour Finals. And that's why he finds himself in this tournament as well. Both these players at 6-4, Martin, which means that right now they are playing for the chance at a win in him next round. I'm really looking forward to this matchup also because this is basically the Sultai deck that has been, you know, one of the one of the three best decks in the format, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the for the past couple of weeks. But the testing team around the CLB players and the Steve Louis, Sam Sherman, uh, Ruff Levy, and Metnaz, they decided to Add white solely for for uh, Yasharn, mm. which is a new card, a new card from Zen Zendikar, which is supposed to stop exactly decks like this. It's supposed to be in the deck exactly to stop John Sacrifice from from doing that, their thing. It's supposed to stop goblins from getting extra mana from Skirk Prospector. It even stops you from getting red red mana from your uh, Ramona Prince, as, as I just found out in my match uh, on the ladder. And yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see uh, how this how this goes now with, with Zendikar being added into the mix. As you can see, these two players had one and one. This is game three between these two here. And you would have thought that Nasif's Yashan would have been doing a lot of work in this, uh, in this particular matchup here, although it's not in his hand right now. Let's see what he wants to do with his turn here. Probably just gonna Nassif's keep up with Ethergust. Nasir's hand is really good. Like he's gonna, he's in the play. He's gonna be able to to gust uh, anything from from Kristoff that that he finds uh, is is too dangerous to let resolve. Next turn he, he can go Uro uh, to ramp from three to four, and the turn after he can drop Nissa. So all he needs to draw is just one more land, and he's gonna be able to to start uh, getting uh, three three lands and getting additional mana. Okay, Gabe uh, deciding that there is nothing. Uh, that Christoph can play uh, on turn two that he would be interested in either gusting, so he just decides to to play the water grave tapped without giving away what his hand is, mm -hmm. which does make sense. 
and now can shock into Uro here, and that will set up that Nissa play next turn, as you say. I think now, now we might see him just sit on the gust to be able to just like counter something like collective company. But the proactive plan of going with this, it just seems uh, better to to Gabe. Yeah, absolutely. Considering especially that all of those lands are in play except for the Water Grave of Forest, so it's going to provide a, provide a sizable shot in the arm here for his mana production. And it's a breeding pool put into play now rather than that in Dathra Triumph, probably holding on to the Triumph to suck a little way at some point. Land the apart from the Nissa, Nassif's hand is a little threat light. Yeah, good thing is that Gabe does have that fabled passage and the Triumph, which is which is two cards he's gonna be able to put into the graveyard, along with that either gust, which is gonna make it make it easier for him to bring back Uro. But as we see right now, Christoph is ready with that soul soul guide lantern to get rid of it. Claim the Firstborn is a really, really good answer to Nissa, being able to steal that land, attack Nissa for three, and then sack the land to, yes. to which is open afterwards. But we know that Gabe is going to be able to play Nissa on tap that breeding pool and still have a, a land that produces two mana uh, untapped to be able to do something about that with the Aether Gust. Another forest with the Fable Passage, unsurprising to see that one, of course, given that Nyssa juices up all these forests so very effectively, and waking up the Breeding Pool, of course, in order to cast Aether Gust. Now, the thing with Claim the Firstborn is, you know, we talked about how good it is against Nyssa, and it's really just great in a format where there are so many aggressively costed uh, cheap creatures flying around, especially the power level of cards like Euro. But it doesn't get Yashan, and that really does speak to the fact that Yashan seems very deliberately designed in order to shine in a matchup like this. Claim the Firstborn doesn't hit the uh, the big pig. It does That's hit true. the breeding pool. But I imagine it's really big. Uh, the fact that uh, both Yashard and Omnath, like two of the most important cards from Zendikar, mm -hmm. both of them cannot be targeted by Claim the Firstborn is is, is a really, really, really big blow uh, to the to the Jund, Jund deck. Mm. Yeah, to anything looking to uh, leverage claim the first point here. Now, do you ether gust this claim is the question, because even even if you don't, even if you just tap the breeding pool, they they still get it back. They can still attack with it here. So do you do you get rid of this uh, this claim? I'd be tempted to. I'd certainly be tempted to. I would be tempted to as well, but obviously we know the opponent's hand. We know that there is nothing else that, you know, not, nothing better that Gabe might want to save the gust for. But, yeah, I think I like it. Uh, this lets me untap with the breeding pool. Uh, along with those, with the forest and, and uh, Trium and Overgrown Tube. So I'm going to have a lot of mana next turn. The more mana I have, it's going to let me, you know, cycle Trio, maybe find something, something like a Hydrocrasis. So I would be very tempted to to use the Either Gust here on, on the claim, because it's also like pretty likely that the opponent would not even uh, want to put the claim back on top. They would probably just put it on, on the bottom, maybe. Well, Gabe's going to use almost his entire rope here to think about it, which is a highly characteristic Gabriel Nassif play, a man known for his considered pace of play is, is one way to put it. I actually was teasing him about this, right? And he was, to, have, you, have you read, um, you know, do you know Malcolm Gladwell, the, the author? Mm -hmm. You may have heard that Malcolm Gladwell claims that it takes 10,000 hours to become a master at anything. Mm -hmm. And so Gabriel Nassif, rather than spend <laughs> 10,000 hours actually, you know, playing as many games as possible, I was like, well, if I just sit here roping out, then I'll become a master, quote unquote, faster than anyone else. Uh, I'm not sure point. that's quite how it works. No, it's <laughs> definitely how it works. No, 10,000 hours, that's all it takes. You, become, you, play, you do 10,000 hours doing anything and you instantly become a master. And so he was like, well, I'm busy. I mean, I don't, I mean, clicks in this economy, I'll just sit here and rope out for 10,000 hours and there you go. I mean, he's a Hall of Famer, so it obviously worked for him. That is pretty funny. Uh, Gabe is going to be able to pull, out, pull a lot of pressure here on Kristoff, though. So even though that Kristoff does have that Bolas Citadel in hand, which he might he might be uh, he might be casting next turn if there is a land on the top of his deck, and he can help that by scrying with Vostrider, he's not going to have a lot of life to play with. That's that's the problem. Gabe is going to be able to make another three three here, attack for six. Presumably the O one Goat token is going to. Chum block one of those lands, give Kristoff one scry. So Kristoff would go down to 10, which is still a pretty reasonable life total if you are casting spells for free off of Bolas Citadel, especially when you have that Voice Rider in play, which is going to let you, mm. it's going to let you like manip manipulate the top of your library. 
And that's one of the reasons that Bolas of Citadel really shines in this matchup in particular. Um, oh, sorry, in this in this deck in particular is because it does have ways to manipulate the top of the uh, the deck with uh, with Woe's Trident and what have you. And, and it's really important to be able to do that because, you know, if you just play a Bolas of Citadel, immediately have another Bolas of Citadel on top. You just want right. to have your entire deck at the Paper Shredder at that point. So here is the Citadel, as we mentioned. And with Woe's Trider, I mean, maybe there's a chance that... Uh, I don't think you can really go off this turn, can you? Just well, land on top, so mm, gonna gonna try. Let's have a look. Yeah, that's one of the cards that either goes does not interact with Bolas Citadel is black, so Gabe is not gonna be able to de to do anything about it. But he does mm. have that Nissa, and Kristoff hit three lands in a row, basically. So uh, Gabe is gonna be able to put a lot more pressure on Kristoff. Yeah, the Woe Strider also being black means that uh, Aether Gust can't remove it as a blocker to pour, force through lethal here. Um, I mean, look at let's look at the tools that Prince has here. He's got the he's got the he's got a reasonable life total for now. He's got a witch's oven, which can gain some life as well, and he's got a blocker in the form of Woe Strider that can trade with the land. I, this doesn't seem to me to be enough to beat a a, oh. a a Nissa, and it certainly doesn't seem to be enough to beat an enormous Hydroid <laughs> Crisis here. Yeah, Nissa is one of those cards where if it sits on the battlefield for two or three turns, mm -hmm. it just snowballs so much that there's usually just no coming back from it. Yeah, that's right. Like any any Mirari's Wake type effect, uh, it becomes compounded the longer that it sits there in play, its impact. And and we're going to see here exactly. This is the one-two punch that people lived in fear of in Standard for a long time, Nissa into Hydroid Crisis. And it's uh, it's not much less impactful in Historic as well. Now, Gabriel just waiting for that rope to appear before he takes an action. And then <laughs> it's the Fable Passage, and I think we're just going to see an enormous crisis here. Yeah, Gabe is going to be able to cast a giant Hydra Crisis, then presumably untap one of those lands to smash for six. At this point, I think it's a lot uh, more important to pressure the opponent's life total than to draw more cards from Hydra. Like, if sure. I'm sitting here with this choice of, like, do I tap these two lands to draw two more cards, or mm -hmm. do I want to attack with them? I'm always going to go with the attack, because I know my opponent's at 10 life with Polossus Citadel in play, and I, I don't want them to cast any free spells next turn so the the more damage you deal to them it's kind of like if you sort of discarded cards from their hand or, or if you just like stop them from you know being able to play more cards next turn so here we've got Nassif able to put Prince down to one here with this eliminate can attack uh, yeah. the nine and eliminate the woe strider and that basically blanks the um the Boltus of Citadel being on one life it's uh it, it really just means that it's going to do absolutely nothing so here's that eliminate Get rid of the Woe Strider here. Chuck it into the Witch's Oven, of course. Yeah, and Kristoff does not really have any outs. Like even something no. like, like Collective Company just just gets countered by the by the either gust. So, yeah, I think this is going to be it here for Prince. I think Nasif is going to earn himself a uh, a shot at getting to uh, at, get, at getting this uh, this winning in here. Food token in order to play the Cauldron Familiar off the top. Now that's a good chump block. Of course, it does uh, it does combo nicely. With the Witch's Oven. Here's a Gilded Goose as well. And I'll land. Hasn't but played a land yet. Without that Vo Strider in play, it's going to be a lot harder to, uh, you know, try to get out of this. Yep. And with a Corvold on top here. Uh, I mean, technically you can play it, but it's not going to end well for you if you do. <laughs> <laughs> can you actually even play it? Like, can you pay the life if you don't have it? I don't no, think but he can. Can, he, can, he can eat the food to go up to five. Or to six, and then and then play right, it right, right. Okay, back okay. on one. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but no, you you can't pay life that you don't have. So you couldn't play a, uh, a for example, a core vault when you're just on three life. So this turn technically that. not over here for Prince. You could use that, which is open also to to sort of cycle the cauldron familiar ones to go up to four life. So basically seven with that with that food token if you want to but up to six problem. down to one here's an ether gust for the corvold and a mayhem devil on the top i think this i think we're about to see the end of this game here christoph prins i think is about to bow out to gabriel nasif who will move on to round 12 playing for a spot in the top eight, there's the good game from Christoph Prinz and the concession, meaning that Gabriel Nassif takes out the game and indeed the match two games to one with his bug pig deck.
He's done very well for him. And uh, Martin, he'll be fighting for a slot in the top in round 12. Yeah, that was just the power of, of Nissa being, you know, unchecked for two or three turns. And I really like the decision uh, from Gabriel to either guys that first claimed the firstborn, which allowed him to really start building all those three threes and, and eventually put so much pressure on Christoph that he wasn't able to uh, really use his uh, Citadel effectively. Well, we are going to go to a break, and then after that, we've got Gabriel Nassi sorry, uh, Raphael Levy, excuse me, playing off against Alan Wu. Will we fill another top eight slot? You're going to find out after this. Coverage of the 2020 season grand finals continues here. Riding night joined by the Czech Hall of Famer Martin Hughes. A great pleasure to have your company. Thanks for joining us here. We're going to check in with the exciting game between Rafa Levy and Alan Wu. These two players here, both playing four color decks, although four color decks of a very different type. We've got Levy on Bug Pig, Turbo Pig here. This basically Sultai mid range deck that's splashing for Yashan. And on the other end, uh, Alan Wu, who, who, who is playing for top eight at seven wins. If he uh, picks up a win here, he will be in our top eight. He's playing on that ramp. Now, a quick note, we haven't seen a lot of uh, Alan on the broadcast this weekend. He has had some technical issues in terms of uh, being able to broadcast his uh, his arena uh, perspective for us. So uh, for fans of Alan Wu, we do apologise, but uh, it's been beyond our control a little bit here. Basically, we've been unable to, uh, to bring him to broadcast, but we are going to get to see him play here against... Uh, the French Hall of Famer, Raphael Levy, who, Martin, as I say, is playing what is effectively Sultai mid-range with that white splash. Yeah, the difference between these two decks is that Raphael Levy wants to be a little bit more interactive. Like we see him with those cards like Essence Scatter, Thoughtseize, you know, either Gust, while Ellen is more about, you know, my deck has all the explosive power of Lotus Cobra, Omnath, and I'm, and I'm just, just just trying to do my own thing. I'm just trying to play a lot of lands, cast these Genesis ultimatums, and just, I don't really want to interact with you. As long as you're not killing me by turn three or four, I don't really care what you're doing. Oracle of Muldire here, a juicy target for this Essence Scatter, but Levy is certainly taking his time to think about it. Now, Levy's position here, a little more tenuous than Wu's. If Levy wins here, he will have to win again in round 12 in order to get to the top eight, whereas Wu has a straight shot at it here with a win. 
eight wins as the magic number. As soon as someone hits that eight win threshold, they do just automatically get a, a, a an express ticket, a non-stop service all the way to the top eight. <laughs> what one of the one of the new things uh, about Zendikar and Historic is that now you can thought seize away lands in some situations mm. because players have been replacing some of the you know basic lands in their deck, for example, with the with the double face cards. And sometimes mm. now you can catch somebody off guard with with like a very well-timed thought season on turn one and leave them with only one land in their hand sometimes. Yeah, they, they keep like, um, you know, a two land or one of which is a flip land and your thought season like, oh, take your second <laughs> land there, buddy. He's an escape to the wilds, but Levy is, has come prepared. Ether Gust is going to prevent this from resolving here. Yeah, I think we're going to see that escape to the wilds be cast again next year and into, into another Ether Gust. So this is going to, this is going to take... Ellen's next turn while Raphael is going to be able to presumably uh, progress his board a little bit with, with all these extra land drops from Grow Spiral and Uro, and eventually he's going to be able to bring that Uro back into play and start attacking. Mm -hmm. But for now, it looks like it's going to be a Growth Spiral here for Levy. Levy, of course, one of Magic's most uh, long-standing and accomplished players. He's been around for donkey's years, this bloke, almost since the very beginning of the uh, of the game and, and certainly been a, a fixture since the start of competitive Magic. Entered into the Hall of Fame sometime... Oh, when was it? Ruff, was, Ruff played something like 100 Pro Tours in a row. It's, yeah. it's really it's a really big accomplishment to even qualify oh, yeah. he's, for one of these. To even qualify he's been for playing, one. He's been playing in them since... What was it? Since what? Probably the late like 17th century, I think he's been going. It's a <laughs> long time. Like a like long that. time. Here's another Escape to the Wilds, a tidy rip there from Wu, but it's not going to resolve once again. Levy's come prepared with another copy of Eth Gust. So judicious stuff here from Levy, who uh, declined the option to play that Uro and is being rewarded with disciplined play in preventing this Escape to the Wilds from resolving. And he's even got another one for next turn, Extin Extinction Event off the top, but we're going to see Uro now. So we can find a these, Titan Nathan Drop. These either guys are doing some really, really good work. It's, it, it, effectively, it, it, it effectively serves as, as a time walk in, in the last two turns by just always putting that Escape to the Wilds on top of Ellen's, Ellen's library while Ruff is just, just able to do his own thing. Either Gust, once again to, this, <laughs> to Escape to the Wilds, once more. And uh, Wu, I mean, he's just kept putting it on top, back on top of the library and, and, and Levy's just kept time walking him here. It's going to go on top once again. If Raph draws a land here, uh, I think he might be able to cast both Nissa and Uro in the same turn, which is right. going to be a really, really big swing. So here can, yes, yeah, yeah, can play the island. Has got three forests in order to do this. I think the Zagoth Triumph is critical on this plan. Let's have a oh, think. Oh no, about you're it not here. gonna have you're not gonna have double blue. Actually, it doesn't work. If you had a breeding pool instead yeah, of water, yeah. Yeah, yeah, if that would that would allow him to do it. But he's gonna be he's gonna be able to produce four mana. But actually, no, he's, he, he he can still do it. He can just tap the Triumph, then untap it and use then it. Then it. Yeah, yeah. You need that. The the key thing was having a forest slash island there. Whether it was a breeding pool or a Zagoth Triumph, this means you can't attack with the. Uh, with the try, but that's not too much of an issue here. As powering out another Busto Mythic is certainly a rich reward. Oh, and a Hydroid Crisis off the top. How about that one? Wow. And now, yeah. wow, this is this has been insane. Like using those three gusts as effectively three time walks yeah. has allowed has allowed Levy to to go from two or three lands in play into Nissa plus Uro and a Hydroid in hand. Like this is just yeah. a strong, really really strong position. Yeah, and imagine another another land, another forest off the top. This Hydro Crisis is going to completely refill Levy's hand here next turn, uh, thanks to that Nissa. While uh, Wu has a uh, a decent enough um, escape to the wilds, but it's going to be a little anemic here. Playing a Lotus Cobra and uh, not doing not too much else with it. Or can, no, actually, what? Can cast the, uh, the Omnath as well. Forget it. Oh, my goodness. That Fable Passage working overtime makes a white mana just like that. Wow, 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 wow. Yeah, one thing I learned about this Omnath deck is like you can't you can't ever count it out. It just it always looks like yeah they don't really have you know too much going, but like, bam, one Genesis Ultimatum off the top or one Escape to the Wilds off the top, and like, you start get you start getting into these these crazy board states with 
Lotus Cobras and Omnats and, and trigger yeah. and all the lead fall. And Levy's trigger. not taking any risks here. He's just gonna fight he's gonna snap off that extinction event. No questions asked here. It does it does cost him the triumph. But I don't think he's too unhappy with that. Now we'll see an attack here for nine, which is very nice indeed. And do you just fire off the the, the crisis here? I think you do, right? Oh yeah, you, you you add more attackers to the battlefield. You're gonna draw some cards, possibly, you know, draw into some counter magic, maybe like another copy of of either gust or just something that allows you to interact with the opponent. So I am pretty happy to just cast a smaller hydrate here, even if it's just like a four four or something. Yeah, you're not getting the full value that you could if you waited till the next turn, but this still still seems fine. It's a, it's a decent size. It puts a lot of pressure on next turn. It means that Wu really has to find something, and, and Levy could be fighting. Once again, don't forget, if he has to win not just this game, but also the next game, next, uh, next sorry, next match, next um, next round in order to make the top eight, Wu just needs to win this one. But that's looking increasingly unlikely here. Interesting decision here for uh, Levy, whether he wants to play, he comes to play tap play, or... If, or... Uh, keep those triumphs in hand to cycle them, you know, for possibly more more interaction. Looks like he's going to go for the Fable Passage and keep those triumphs, as you say, to cycle away. Let's see what Wu has found here. Three mana, and it's going to be cycling a Ketria Triumph in his side of the battlefield. He is dead on board, so has to find something. And an Omnath is certainly uh, certainly a card. With the land, of course, gain some life, go back up to 15. There's an explore. Ugh. That's got a spirit not doing much. There's the land, back up to 15 here. And this is a good way to shore up the defenses on the ground as well. Okay, so back up to 15, that's a reasonable life total. All of a sudden, uh, Ruff is not attacking for lethal anymore, but he does have the, uh, the, the ability to cycle both these triumphs and try to look for for a way to remove the Omnath. Triumph into Triome. And a third one still in hand. There's a Mythos. That's there a removal spell. Okay, can't cast it fast enough. So that's 6, 12. Yeah, that should be that should be lethal. And now untapping a land. So we've got 13 damage on the battlefield and then untapping one, turning it into a 3-3. Three, three. This island can come thundering across. Oh, it's going to be a Triome instead. Across it comes the battlefield. And this looks like it should be more than enough to win the game for Raphael Levy, who powers his way into round 12. He has earned his chance for a win and in into this top eight. So congratulations to Raphael Levy, scrapping hard, digging deep, triple time warp with those ether gusts and a well-deserved victory for the French Hall of Famer. Yeah, great game and a, a perfect perfect example of, you know, all these ether gusts being used to just like, I'm going to trade my two mana for your five three turns in a row. So this is going to let me, you know, advance my own board state while you're just sitting there casting the same card over and over. And before you know it, I have Anissa and Uro in play while you're still trying to cast the same one card. Well, Martin, I'm very sorry to say that all good things must come to an end and also all mediocre things must come to an end. And that is it for you and I in the booth today. And uh, that's it for Martin as well in the booth this weekend, Martin. As ever, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to work with you, my friend. You're one of the best in the business. So thank you for uh, helping uh, helping me look good throughout this Likewise. weekend. It, uh, it really has been great to work with you, mate. And uh, thanks for being part of the podcast this weekend. Yeah, likewise. And thanks for having me. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Hopefully we're going to get to you know, do more of these. Uh, good, good, luck, good luck to everybody uh, who made the top eight or you know, anybody who's still playing for it. Uh, this tournament has been has been fun to watch. I really like the I really like the two constructed formats uh, structure. And yeah, it's been it's been fun to watch and you know made the made the best player win. All right. Well thanks once again Martin User for your expertise. But right now we're gonna take a quick break and well, on the other side of it we'll be back with round number twelve, the last round of our Swiss pairings. Don't miss it. We'll be back very soon.